So everybody, it's a true pleasure and honor to have Christina Marchetti give us one of the talks in the series. Without further ado, Christina, please tell us about living history. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I dutifully prepare slides. And thank you, Sri and Orit and the entire team for organizing this. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Pavia, a city in the north of Italy on the Ticino River, uh, which has a the city has a very long history, goes back to Roman times, as a cover bridge, lots of cobblestones, and one of the oldest universities in Europe, 1361, something like that. So I grew up there. Uh, my family, my parents grew up in Pavia as well during World War II. Uh, my father, at the age of 16, in 1943, uh, left high school to join the resistance in the mountains of Val d'Aosta. And then my parents met shortly after the war, um, and they both went back to school and put themselves through college. They were the first uh, and actually only one in their extended families to, to go to college. My father became a lawyer. And uh, my mother studied math and physics, and she became a high school teacher. Uh, but uh, after I was born, she decided to stay home with me and my sister, and did that for about 10 years until my brother was born. She went back to work about a year after my brother was born. I guess she had enough. And as the oldest sister, I was supposed to help take care of him, but I wasn't very interested. As you can see, that's me right there. I, would, I read a lot and including a lot of comic books and Flesh Gordon was one of my favorites. I have stocks, stacks and stacks of Flesh Gordon still back in Italy. I left them with my brother. So then school, uh, okay, I went to a high school where we studied a lot of classics, uh, ancient Greek, Latin, philosophy, history, art history, you name it. But we also studied physics and math. And actually I enjoyed both math and physics and the old languages. And I struggled to decide what to do at the university. At the end, I decided to major in physics at the University of Pavia because I lived there and the university was there. And uh, probably a lot of the decision had to do with the fact that uh, um, it was hard, nobody else was doing it. And I had this strange idea that it might actually be easier to get jobs by doing physics than by doing ancient Greek or Sanskrit, but not sure that was true, but that's what I did. And as you can see, lots of columns in my early education. Our gym in high school had columns, in fact. So then um, I finished at university and my dream was to actually do research and get a career in academia, but there was basically no way to do that in Italy, no path. There wasn't even a PhD program. So I substituted in high school as a teacher for about six months. And then I was lucky I got a Fulbright travel fellowship and I went to the University of Florida for a PhD. My parents were actually very supportive and encouraging for me going to the US to study. Uh, my friends from high school and college thought I was crazy. And I have to say it was a very hard transition in many ways. I can tell you more if people ask me questions, but I was very lucky. I, had a, I found a wonderful thesis advisor, Jim Dafty, and I worked with him on sort of formal problems in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. If it wasn't because of Jim, I wouldn't be here today. I would have left after a year and gone back to Italy. Um, in Florida, I also met Mark Bowick, uh, that eventually became my husband. So I graduated from the University of Florida, and then things got complicated. Uh, I will describe my path using active matter language as a persistent random walk. I was kind of a self-propelled particle. As you'll see, there are lots of deviations, tumbles <laughs> along the way. So I took a postdoc at the University of Maryland and then a second one at Rockefeller University where I kept doing formal non-equilibrium stat mech, kinetic, th kinetic theory, even some plasma physics. And then uh, in my first year of the postdoc at Rockefeller, Eddie Cohen, the person with whom I was working, 
uh, in May told me he was not going to renew my appointment. And at that time, you couldn't find a postdoc in May. There was a strict schedule. So it was tough. But again, I was lucky. I found Melux at City College. Melux decided that my background in non equilibrium stat MEC would have been useful for studying uh, photo excited electrons called hot electrons in semiconductor heterostructure. So I started doing something completely different. And it was actually great. My Lux was, was a great guy. And I did actually do some interesting things in, uh, in this field. And I continue to do that when from City College, I took a job at, as a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Meanwhile, this Mark Bowick <laughs> that I had met in Florida and we got married sometime between Maryland and, uh, and Rockefeller. Well, he graduated from Caltech, he went to Yale and MIT. And then again, we got lucky, we both got jobs at Syracuse University. So we went to Syracuse University and we were there for 30 years. And uh, very recently, a few years ago, we both moved to UC Santa Barbara. So as you can see, uh, first of all, so far, nothing about biological physics, uh, non equilibrium stat MAC, so real solid state physics. But at Syracuse, I was there for a long time. And I have to say, um, I had a great time at Syracuse, many great colleagues, wonderful students, many wonderful collaborators. 30 years is a long time. But there were a few events that really influenced my uh, scientific path. And they were mostly associated with long visits or sabbaticals. First at Harvard, two sabbaticals in 88 and 98 where I worked with David Nelson and also with Valerie Villocourt, who was at Arvon at that time, on vortex matter, statistical physics of vortex lines in type two superconductors. Still sounds a lot like hard condensed matter physics, but really was non-equilibrium stat mech. And then um, a visit to KITP in 2002, and then a sabbatical in Paris in 2007. In 2002, that's when I started working with Tanny Liverpool, on active matter and active matter itself evolved and became more and more biological. And I had a great time working with Jean-Francois Joanny and Sriram Ramaswamy, who I've actually known since we were graduate students. So uh, other really great collaborators and friends. And there were one more thing. And so at that point I moved more towards, bio, that's when I started working more on biological systems. And one more thing I want to highlight about the time in Syracuse is the time when Aparna Baskaran was my postdoc for four years, because that was also when I was department chair. And Aparna literally saved me. Without Aparna, I don't know what I would have done. But the other interesting part of the story is that Aparna, I was one of the first students of Jim Duct in Florida, and Aparna was just about the last. So we go back to Jim Dufty, who really had a big influence in my life. So what else can I tell you? I was asked to tell you something about what I have learned. I don't think I've learned all that much, but I tried to write down a few things. So the first thing is that really it's important, I think, to find and keep good collaborators and mentors. You can't really do it alone. But the other thing I would say is never hesitate to try new direction, new direction in science. I think I did that a lot in my career. And it has always been fun and led somewhere interesting. Um, the other thing is, I don't think it's important think, not to waste a lot of time comparing yourselves to others. You're better, you're worse. Every path is different. So, and um, I have a very good time interacting with students, with young people. And I think it's important to really be generous of your time. You can learn a lot. I certainly have learned a lot from my students and my postdocs and, and so on. So um, I really owe a big thank to all collaborators, students, friends. Uh, last December, I had a big birthday and uh, a group of my students all together and postdocs, former ones organized this uh, Zoom birthday party uh, on a Sunday morning, Sunday evening for many people in Europe and all these people came and it was, it was just wonderful. So this reminded me how uh, lucky I am to have had all these people in, uh, in my life. 
And also, of course, thanks to, to my family, this is a pretty old photo. I couldn't find any recent photo where all four of us are together, as a matter of fact. <laughs> my daughters are quite, quite more grown up now. But uh, that's, uh, so that's it. And uh, I hope there'll be some questions. I don't know how long I took. I hope not too long. Uh, uh, you were absolutely on the dot, Christina. Thank you so okay. much. Um, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, please just unmute yourself and jump right in. Can I ask a question? Please go for it. Um, so um, you mentioned um, some of your transitions uh, during the postdoc and I think, um, uh, you know, struggling with funding for a postdoc position and the need to move is something that happens, you know, a lot, but not a lot of people can talk about it. Um, do you have any advice for uh, young career people who experience um, similar uh, issue? I guess the main advice is not to give up. I mean, I, I actually, to be quite honest, I was fired. <laughs> That's actually the word that I, the one should actually use. <laughs> in this case, okay? Uh, because it's not a lack of funding. It was just that Eddie Klein told me that uh, he, he didn't think working with me was uh, something that he liked and so I should find a new job. And um, I was devastated and uh, I was ready to give up, but you know, then I thought about it a bit harder and I decided that he was wrong. And, that, and uh, so I think it's important really not to give up and uh, to try to, it's not easy, but you, you know, and then I, as I said, at that time, there was really quite a schedule for postdoctoral positions. It was not easy to find one in May, most, most had been filled. But uh, I, somebody told me about my Luxor City College and I went over to see him and, and then, then things worked out fine. So, you know, just persist. That's what I think. Yeah, that's a good advice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question, if anybody wants to jump in. Hi, Christina, I have one question. So you have been in many institutions and in... Uh, <laughs> a bit in too US, many, right? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. And in, in US, the conventional wisdom, especially in sciences, is that uh, the quality, the discrepancy in quality between the institutions can be pretty large. For example, there can be a fantastic group at the University of Chicago, not, and physics research might not be as good at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, so what, what is your view on it? How, how do you view this perception on one hand of the quality and the reality on the other hand? Well, I think, so the reality, I think, is that there are excellent people everywhere. And there are, for instance, excellent students. You can find excellent students everywhere. I've had very good students at Syracuse, for instance. And I had very good colleagues. Um, what the perception, however, what you're saying is the, from, from the perception from the outside is certainly true. And it can make it more difficult for you to... Sometimes you might, you might actually even sometimes make it more difficult even to, to get grants or things like that, I think. Uh, so, and that's something that uh, we, we need to fight. You know, often you hear people talking about all the, the strong groups, uh, the, 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 the important groups and so on. And that's something that, I don't know, I find always very <laughs> unpleasant <laughs> essentially, because my experience is that there are excellent people everywhere. Um, it's true that if you are in a place where there is a lot going on, a lot of visitors coming and going, you are exposed to more ideas. And that's why I think if you are at a smaller university, I think it's important to go visit other places and spend time other places. Not sure if I answered your question. I don't know if I have an answer yes, to your I question. Think, but <laughs> that's yeah, my answer. experience. Thanks. Well, Thanks. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for the inspiring talk and uh, radical positions in your answers. Um, <laughs> with that, I would like to um, thank you again. On behalf We're not of recording the answers, are we? <laughs> so, did it again? Oh, we are actually. Are we posting the answers? <laughs> are we? Um, we um, so is there time for one more question? Uh, go for it. Go for it. 
I, I was actually very curious about what your father did in the resistance. Oh, well, he joined uh, one of the um, um, brigades of the partisans in, in the mountains. And uh, he was, uh, you know, he was fighting essentially against the Germans. Uh, it's, a, it's a very long story that actually, it might seem very strange, but influenced even my childhood a lot, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And in what way? I was, that was going to be my follow up. Oh, it was always with us. We would go back as children to visit uh, the people in the farms, in the mountains that uh, mm -hmm. had hosted him or helped him. Um, my brother carries the name of a friend, the, the battle name of a friend of his that was uh, killed and, and things like that. So it was always a big presence somehow. I am not saying it's good or bad, it just mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the way it was. Well, thank you, Ashok, and thank you again, Christina, for graciously answering all of our questions. Uh, I have a few more, but we'll wait till breakout sessions. Um, everybody, please put your hands together. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Chantal, to, um, to lead people to the small group discussions. <laughs>